something. Welcome to Impact Discipleship. Yes. That was both. That was Isaac and Val together. You couldn't hear Val. <laughs> she was speaking in her mind. So welcome. I'd like to say on camera what I said off camera a moment ago for those that follow us online. I promised last time we were in James we would hit James chapter 5, 7 to 12, but we will only reach 11 because the notes got so cumbersome and I was up to over 30 pages for this one study and we didn't want to do that on a Saturday morning. That's a little crazy. So I uh, will handle James 5, 12 the next time we meet on James. And so I do need someone to read James 5, 7 to 11. We'll be covering this, uh, these verses in a message called Patience and Perseverance, right? You'll see why. And um, yeah, so let's get started. Let's jump right in. Who's going to do the reading? I can. Go ahead. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord... See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that brings me back. I was raised Catholic, and that's what happened every single time they read a Bible verse in church. This is the word of the Lord. And then we all say, praise be the Lord our God. Something like that. Anyway. Let me just bring you back and remind you of something. The author of this letter is James, the half-brother, the brother of Christ, right? So his, you know, another child of Mary and Joseph, uh, although Joseph wasn't obviously Yeshua's biological father. And um, he's, he, you know, throughout this entire letter, he's very scholarly, right? He's a, he's a Jew of Jews. He really, he really knows the word. He does a lot of references to not only his brother's teachings, which we'll see, but also a good knowledge of the Old Testament, right? And so um, he starts off in verse se verses seven and eight, uh, bringing us back as we're coming, we're circling back, very good writing style. He's circle we're, we're, we're coming around to the end of this letter and he reminds us about something in the beginning of the letter. Right, because he started he started off the letter with the same message without without specific reference. More like, hey, as a Christian, you have to live this way. But now he's giving some meat behind it, referring to some uh, concepts that he is drawing from a deep knowledge of the Old Testament. Some of the things that you may not even recognize he's talking about, like when he when he mentions Job, you say, oh yeah, that's that's in the Old Testament. But in this first area. When he talks about being patient, brethren, and talks about precious fruit of the earth, and, uh, and a farmer waiting patiently for the early and latter rain, this is a reference. First of all, this is an agricultural community, right? And the entirety of the, uh, the schedule uh, of God, underst us understanding seasons, has to do with planting and harvesting. But very specifically, he says this phrase, early and latter rain. Now, if you're a farmer, you might know what that means, right? There's, there's two seasons of, of, of rain. Um, if you know anything about planting and harvesting. Um, and there's, there's really, so if we, let me just bring you back very quickly to what he said right in the beginning, like second, second through fourth, ver, fourth verse of the letter. He, said, it's, he says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you face various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work in you, that may, you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That doesn't have Old Testament reference to it, but the concept of being patient and having perseverance is established right from the beginning of the letter, right? And he's telling us the ultimate goal. This is a, like such a great, like if you were to analyze writing style or teaching style, this is 
this, this today would stand the test of time. Tell people what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, a, that is a classic style. He's telling us, by the way, mm -hmm. here's the goal. Christ-likeness. Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect in every way. Uh, how do you get there? Uh, trials. Testing. What do we have to do during that time? Patience and perseverance. When you come out on the other end, you'll be, mm -hmm. you'll be Christ-like, right? And, and he's referring to his brother's or earthly ministry and his brother's testimony that, that he knows the story, meaning uh, his brother had to go into the wilderness and be tested. He came out sinless. He came out perfect, meaning he never, he never yielded to the temptation. So, so and what is the, the picture? It's, it's, a, it's a trial by fire. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a trial designed like the heating of precious metals, right? It's it's a um, it's a it's a it's it's where you you heat the metals enough so the impurities can rise to the top. They call that dross, and the liquid metal is kind of bubbling there, and you scoop off these impurities that are in the metal. Um, and the admonition to us is, by the way, if you want to be purified, it's going to be like you have to be heated up like metals, and then and then and then that an impure surface will kind of you just you just kind of get get an instrument and you scrape it right off the top while it's still liquid right and 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 it's because there is no way to do that the entire impetus for transformation is trials right so um, that should remind you of a couple of things I mean if you're if you're a Bible student you know if you've, you've had any Bible reading behind you, things should come to your mind, right? It's through much tribulation that you enter the kingdom, um, uh, that, and then what the kingdom is. The kingdom is, or maybe you won't, you won't know this, but, you know, with deep study, you discover the kingdom is very literally the perfection of God manifesting in humans. Human and humans. So you have and in a sense, and how that manifests in the earth is the government of heaven operating in the earth, right? So it's, it's, both, it's both human and governmental because perfect humans govern perfectly and, and there's a structure behind it. That's why the whole universe is, is, uh, is legal. It has structure and legality behind it and the government of heaven is, is God operating in humans, right? And that's what it means that through much, think about it now, through much tribulation, through much heating in the fire and the scooping off of the dross, you become like Christ. You enter the kingdom. You become a kingdom manifestation, right? The second idea that this conjures up in my mind is the idea of, of legitimacy. Legitimacy. If you're following in our note pack, it's, it's kind of like the middle of, of page three. Legitimacy as sons, legitimacy as children of God, right? Um, so let me let me tell you if you, you if you have, who's got the notes, who wants to let's go to uh, let's go to the the bottom of page three, and I want to read a, a section of scripture from Acts four nineteen and twenty. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna somebody's gonna read it. Who's got it? Here, go ahead, give this there. The bottom of it. So if you're following your Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter uh, 14, sorry, 19 and 20. Just read that section that says, Then the Jews. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. Having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derby, and they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith and saying, we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are picking this up. It gets so easy to read the Bible like it's a two-dimensional document on paper. But I want you, like, if you were making a movie scene, this is what it looks like. They beat Paul, 
so badly they thought he was dead. It's not like they smacked him in the face and said, be gone. They beat him to the point they thought he was dead. When nobody was looking, he got up, he brushed himself off, <laughs> went into the next city and started preaching again. And God do, you, do you realize how insane that is? And, and, the, and the, the takeaway is, this is, part of the, this is part of the process. This is part of the program. The program is to become like Christ. When, by the way, the phrase, you have to lock this in your brain, enter the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It means purified like Christ, right? Become like Christ. It even says in um, Hebrews chapter 2, for it was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom all things are in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of salvation perfect through suffering. Meaning Christ's perfection was, was ongoing and persistent, obviously, on earth, but he was perfected ultimately in death. Meaning he made it to the finish line having never sinned. Right? And you know the, the suffering. You know the persecution. Mm -hmm. It also says in Hebrews chapter 12, listen, we all raise our hands. Hey, do you want to be sons of God? Oh, I'm a, I'm a son of God. I'm a son of God. I want to be sons of God. Well, this is, this, is, this is what God says about how he treats sons. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have become partakers, meaning he's already talking to people that are struggling through being persecuted, suffering, tribulations. If you're without that, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we haven't had, had human fathers who corrected us and we, pay, we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirit and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us and it seemed best to them, but he, for our prophet, he God, that we may be partakers of his holiness. You see, how do you become like Christ? Oh, you have to be treated like a legitimate child and you have to be tortured. <laughs> you have to go through suffering, right? Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, right? So that's the, that's the picture of patience and perseverance. Now, of course, that doesn't preach well when you're trying to get someone uh, to realize they should become Christians, right? Because the only message to them, like I've taught many times, is, hey, Christ crucified, the heart's already changing, and uh, you, just, you just put the words on it, but no one signs up and goes, oh, wait a minute, Christianity, heated up like, like precious metals till it's boiling, and then scrape off all the impurities in my life? What's that like? Let me do that. Painful. How often, <laughs> how long does that go on? Oh, my whole life as a Christian? Oh, fabulous. <laughs> Can I have two doses? No one does that, right? First, you have the Holy Spirit, and then you realize how worth it it is, right? And the whole developmental process, like, of course, you, you guys all know. I can could, I could look in Josh's eyes right now. He knows where I'm going. Because there's no better place to insert perseverance than Second Peter's discipleship model, right? On your faith, right? You know it, right? Build virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, right? That's the discipleship model. Love is the kingdom. Love is the image of God. Love is the kingdom manifesting in a human, right? That's what love is. God is love. It's all equating. It's the, and that's what the promise is in 2 Peter. It's the divine nature is promised to his children. But the process includes that thing stuck in there, which is perseverance, right? That's one of my favorite areas. We're not going to do it in detail, but just so you, you see it and how it works. Virtue is God's heart. What's right to God? Knowledge is knowing how to apply that. Once you, once you learn it, once, once, you, once you gain insight. Self-control is doing it. So you learn how to do it, and then you do it. And everything that comes with doing it, the struggles, the trials, the persecution, the, the, the failure, the disappointment, has to be met with one trait, perseverance. The next thing, you, how long do you do it? Forever, never quit, never stop. Keep going. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're 
tortured and suffering till the day you breathe your last breath. It doesn't matter. That's what he's saying. It's always part of the process. It's always part of the process. If we look to the top of page 6, I would like someone to read that Romans 5, that Romans 5, uh, you can pass it to someone else. There you go. The top of page 6, let's read Romans 5, 1 to 5. Again, you're going to see how perseverance is inserted into every single process for Christians. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. There should be so many cha-ching moments when you see that scripture. First of all, start off with um, the grace in which we stand. Grace is God's supernatural power. He's talking about life, not death. He's talking about life on earth, not life in eternity. Mm-hmm. And you're standing in that grace right now. That means you're standing with access to God's supernatural power. In that, you rejoice. Why? Because it's the only way you can glory in tribulations. And tribulations is the only path to the hope that's in you. It's the only path. There is no path otherwise. No free ride. Nobody skates by without tribulations. It's not part of God's plan. Even his son was tortured and had to die to be proved perfect. And if you're a son, that's the way it works. The good news is, hope will never disappoint you. It will never disappoint. The outcome is always glorious. It's always worth it. And that's what, that's what Paul is saying, right? So now we have, to, we have to access this theological piece about timing. Because there's, there's, all, there's a lot of plans going on here. And James, who's clearly very scholarly when it comes to why he's connecting this process to an agricultural statement. He talks about fruit and trees and so on and, and latter rains and former rains. Why is he doing that? Because he understands theologically that there's two, there's two seasons, two ultimate seasons that exist for humanity. And, and, and they even reference the natural seasons in the earth. Two harvests or two grains. You have the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, right? As well as the feast seasons that go with those harvests. He knows this. He's a Jew. Now, if you're a Christian and you don't understand the cycles of God's seasons and the feasts, this stuff makes no... You'll see latter rain and former rain and it'll mean literally nothing. But if it was a computer program, you would click on the arrow and things would open up below and say, wow, this is an expansive idea. Those few words, what does it mean? God has a prophetic plan for mankind and it always happens in seasons, in years, in seasons of years, and a linear timeline from creation to eternity. All framed inside of this thing we call seasons. All And the two seasons are characterized by two types of rain, former rain and latter rain, spring rain and fall rain, light rain and heavy rain, right? The barley, which is a soft grain, grows quickly. It's an immature or childlike grain, and it's harvested in the spring for the Passover season. The wheat is a hardy grain, a mature grain, an adult grain that takes more rain, another outpouring of rain in the latter part or the fall season and is harvested for the fall feasts of of trumpets, Yom Kippur, and tabernacles. Now, you're thinking, how do you get all of that out of James saying former rain and latter rain, right? That was their culture. That's what they knew. And he's framing this process of perseverance around farming because you don't put a seed in the ground and come up the next day and say, oh, look at my crop. You have to look at it. 
You have to work it. You have to protect it. Uh, you have to cultivate it. And you have to wait for it. And there's two seasons, right? You don't try to harvest your wheat in, in, in the spring because you won't get any, there's no kernels, right? And so, um, but here's the thing. Where else does this show up? It does not show up in words, but it shows up in concept and, and the rabbinical Hebraic teaching style is islands of truth planted in a, in, a, in a student's mind or a disciple's mind, and their job is to explore that island and fill in the gap, put bridges between it. That's the teaching style, the Hebraic teaching style. So, so the student would hear a phrase and he'd go find what that means. See, that's what disciples do. Do you remember when Paul in, in Acts 17 came upon the Bereans and, and he called them more noble because he said things to them and then when he left, they searched to see if what he was saying was true. We have been so cultivated, and so trained in a culture that my pastor says, my pastor says, my pastor says, my pastor says. And it's like, I, I remember sitting in church for years saying to my wife, the Bible doesn't say that. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. My wife used to say, be quiet. Don't talk during the sermons. <laughs> but the point is, you have to be able to say, is that what it means? Is that what it says? So if we could turn to the bottom, pass them on to someone else, the bottom of page seven, I would like to read another area of scripture where this concept of former rain and latter rain comes. And then I'm going to connect that for you to something that is in the New Testament. All right. So if you can read the scripture from Joel on the bottom of page 7 in our notes. This is Joel 2, 22 to 23 if you're following in your Bible. Do not be afraid, you beast of the fields, uh, for the open pastures are springing up and the tree bears its fr fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain in the latter rain in the first month. So Joel the prophet is referring to this concept again. And he says this bizarre phrase again. Would it, you wouldn't understand what this means if you weren't, if you weren't steeped in, in these understandings of seasons or even in the Hebrew calendar. So you read that as a Christian, and I say the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And I just explained to you f minutes ago that, that these rains are separated by two different seasons, one in the spring and one in the fall. Then why is Joel calling them the first month? Because in the Hebrew reckoning of time and the calendar, there's two six-month cycles in the year, the spring cycle and the fall cycle. Both of them have first months. Ironically, Judaism celebrates New Year in the first day of the seventh month, not the first day of the first month. Passover shows up in the spring. God calls it the first month of the year. The first day of the seventh month, they celebrate their cycle of years, their, 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 their calendar year, their, their civil year. Both seasons have first months. Both are characterized by the rain that causes the nourishing of the harvest. One former lighter, one latter heavier, right? So I told you it doesn't say this in the New Testament, but does anybody, does anybody's Joel chapter 2 spark anything in anybody's mind around the New Testament? Acts. Acts. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, right? Peter is referring to this area of Scripture, Joel, when he's describing what's happening when the Holy Spirit is pouring out. He's saying, guys, we're not drunk. This is what was prophesied. And he, and he reads, well, recites, I won't do the whole thing, but he basically says, hey, and it shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Old men and, uh, shall dream dreams, your young men visions. 
Fast forward, verse 32, 232, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? He quotes this. What he doesn't quote is what you just read, which comes before that. By the way, this rain that's coming down has two seasons. What you just experienced in Acts chapter 2 was the first season. The former rain, which is what rain? The lighter rain. The one for immature grain. What's the latter rain that's coming? It's the rain that's going to come down to produce the mature grain or the grown-up grain, right? Because it says in the ne- this area of Scripture in James, it says that after he says former rain and latter rain, that it may establish your hearts, grow up your hearts, turn resolutely towards a, a direction. Meaning, you're not acting like a child anymore. Children are all over the place. I want to do this. I want to do this. Adults, it's like, okay, I got to do this. This is the way I'm going. You're steadfast, established. That's what he's saying. Now, I'll refer to this in this teaching from the last few weeks. We did a teaching on Friday nights called uh, Baptism on Dry Ground and uh, Spiritual Violence last night. Talking a lot about maturity. A lot about what, a, what Christ-like maturity looks like, right? And so it's, very, it's a very powerful progression that's happening historically in timelines. Like one from creation to eternity. But it also happens in your lives individually, doesn't it? If you have been a Christian five years, you should be more mature than when you were a Christian six months. You've been a Christian 15 years, it better be more mature than 5 years. 50 years, you better be more mature than 15 years. Right? You should be progressing. If you look back on your faith walk and it's just this straight line, I got saved, I show up at church, I put my Bible on the shelf when I come home, you know, I pick it up again next Sunday and I go back to church with it, I go, yay, 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 the pastor preaches and I agree with everything he says, and that's your life in the faith the whole time. It's like, it's like you're a born-again Christian as an infant, and you stay that way. Well, that is not what the Bible's calling us to do, right? <clears throat> and historically, Christ talks about the harvest, right? In, in John chapter 4, he says, listen, I lift up, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are ripe for harvest, right? John 4.35. And in Luke, he says, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. See, the whole idea is uh, we have to recruit field workers. Like, how are we going to harvest what's coming if we don't recruit field workers? But it's not just get a bunch of, you know, uh, day laborers, right? It's get skilled laborers. That's what we have to develop, skilled laborers. So you can recognize these things. Now, go back before we go on to verse 9 in in, in James 5 and think to yourself, if you were reading James and you were a skilled laborer, when you read the words, you would know what they meant. You would say, oh, I know what former rain and latter rains mean. I know what what he means by uh, purification. Or I understand this idea of patience and perseverance because that's the process. I know all of these things like this. That's why you study the Bible, right? So when you're a young disciple, it's like all new to you. And when you're old, an old disciple, you go, yeah, I know that. That's fully established. You can see the growth. Right in that verse, he says that it's established in your heart. See, those things should trigger things. You say, oh, I know what that means. And listen, we have no excuse in, in, in the modern day we live. You know, back then, I, I was fascinated by like men like Matthew Henry, who wrote extensive Bible commentary without Google. (laughs) In the 1700s, he's writing this, you know, understands every Greek word and every Hebrew word, and he knows references in the Bible. How does he know these things, right? Man, he must be so, he spent a lifetime studying the Bible. We, We could literally look something up. I don't know what that Greek word means. Oh, click a button. Go to an app. Do this. Look it up. We have no excuse. We have no excuse. Right? Okay, on to verse 9. And we could belabor that issue for a long time. Again, Jewish man clearly 
wanting towards the end of this letter to really establish this like Torah-based foundation and understanding. He says, don't grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Can we just say this? <laughs> God hates complaining, right? When they were new to the wilderness, remember, remember, they leave Egypt, they went right into complain mode, right? You can, you can read Exodus 16, 2 to 3, we won't read it, but it just says, it's like the whole congregation complains against Moses. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine what they witnessed? The plagues, the deliverance, an ocean separating, the destruction of the most powerful army in the world, and they say, oh, I wish we were going to go back to Egypt because we've got no food. Can you imagine? We should have died in Egypt, they said. It would have been better. I don't know. That's like Christians, like, not wanting to suffer or not wanting to have any, any trial at all. It, it, and you, have you experienced the exaltation of a born-again experience? It's a thousand times better than what, all the miracles they watched. Do you complain about going back to Egypt? <laughs> right? Oh, it gets better, right? Because, because later on, when they face the promised land for the first time, and, you know, the whole spy things, right? Remember that in, in Numbers 14? The whole spy thing happens. You know what they do? They lift up. Now, mind you, right? So this is like a year later. Right, the first time they the first time they get a chance to go into the promised land is one year after they leave Egypt. They, they they send the spies in, the whole report comes back, and you know what they do? They grumble and complain. Oh, if we would have just died in Egypt, it would would be better for us to go back to Egypt. I, I don't even know what we can say about that. But but God hates it. It says in Numbers eleven. Now when the this is eleven one. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for he heard it, and his anger arose. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. Can you imagine what this looks like? The people are complaining, and God says fireballs around the camp. Everywhere. And the people like this. And Moses is like, by the way, that's because you're complaining. Keep doing it. One's going to hit your tent. <laughs> That's what God's saying. I mean, come on. Are we so, like, displeased? Now, of course, in Philippians, Paul says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Become blameless and harmless children of God. Right? That's in Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Right? And then he turns the corner, and he gives us some examples. Now, I don't know about you, Right? And he, he says, he just uses this phrase. He says in verse 10, this is James 5.10. Now, my brethren, take the prophets as an example. You know, who spoke the name of the Lord. The prophets as an example of suffering and patience. Okay, so here's the deal. Ready? We, we've done all this description about suffering and, and dross and the necessary, the necessary evil of tribulations. And now, again, James thinks of the Old Testament. He says, what about the prophets? Now, we can go through prophets. You know, we could talk about their life and do a whole prophet study. But for me, no greater example arises than Jeremiah. You know, the, the, the digs on Jeremiah is this. He preached his whole message for like 30 or 40 years of ministry, and he literally never made a difference. Like, he never saw any fruit for what he did. But, but I looked up some things which were amazing. Jeremiah, this is, this is some references. By the way, he's called the weeping prophet, this poor guy. His family turns against him, and they plot to kill him. Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. Over the years, he was whipped, put in stocks, attacked by a mob, threatened by, by the king, ridiculed, arrested, beaten, accused of treason, thrown in jail, thrown in a deep well, and then lived through the siege of Jerusalem because no one ever listened to him. That was the prophet Jeremiah. In the notes, there's all the references to those scriptures if you want to see them. <laughs> Can you imagine? We get a hangnail. Or God doesn't answer a question about our headache. 
and, and we bolt. Right? <laughs> no. And we know the history was that not only remember remember who killed the prophets was the people they were trying to help. Right? Mm -hmm. And Yeshua in, in Matthew 23, he's talking to he's talking to the, the religious leaders and he's like, you know who you are? You're the relatives of the ones who build the tombs of the prophets. You, you're, you, you have the guilty seed line of the people that would hear the voice of God through the prophets and instead of shifting and changing, you just killed them. Your life right here, this is Matthew 23, 29 and 31. Your life here is a witness against you. It's just, it's, it's, it's horrible, right? And then, and then he says, he references specifically one guy. Now, did you catch it? He, he, sa he says, let's use the perseverance of Job as an example. Now, Job is like 42 chapters long. If you've never read, I, I, I did once for a teaching for KM, I outlined the whole book bullet pointed all 42 chap all, all 42 chapters it's a horror story you could not write a horror movie worse than what happens to Job right so what does James do he says remember the perseverance of Job right so let me give you a couple of things a oh, matter of fact let's 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 do it together if you would uh, who's got the notes let's hand the notes Joshua can you read and um, you'll be on the bottom of page 12 in our notes. We're almost done. Where it says, Prophet Job, job, you know, Prophet, job description and, re job description, Job description. That would be good. Job description and responsibilities, right? Read Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. It starts on the bottom of page 12. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scornings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. <laughs> This is the job description of a prophet. <laughs> Tortured, mocking, scourging, changed, imprisonment, sawn in two. That was Isaiah. The, guy, the prophet Isaiah got sawn in two. That's how, he, that's how they killed him. They cut him in half while he was alive. Which way? Head down? Oh, I don't know. What does it matter? What's the teaching on Job? Right? Yeah. What? What? You'll see. Watch this. They were tempted, slain with a sword, wandered about in the wilderness. Like, this is the job description of a... Of a of a, a prophet. It says in the next few verses in Hebrews, but here's the payoff. All of these obtained a good testimony through faith, but they didn't even receive the promise because God provided the promise he had for them to you. To you. Now, I don't see any of you wandering around like that. They endured and we complained. They never saw the promise. We see it. Promises Christ like this, the kingdom. The last verse we'll cover today is where he talks about the perseverance of Job specifically. He says, uh, We count them blessed to endure. Haven't you heard about the perseverance of Job? And seen the end intended by the Lord, who is compassionate and merciful? It's, it's unbelievable. I, you know, in Matthew 24, when Jesus is doing his end days teaching, he uses this phrase, those endure, those who endure till the end shall be saved. If you read Matthew 24, 9 to 14, he's talking about the kingdom, he's talking about the end, and he says, those that endure till the end shall be saved. You should know in your Christian theology, you are redeemed to be saved, meaning you are reserved as a Christian for a spot in eternity, but your salvation doesn't come till the end. 
Why? Because if you're saved already, you might not have to endure, endure any of these tribulations. What kind of tribulations? Like Job. Now, if there was anyone, anyone other than Christ deserving of not suffering, it was Job. Like, I want you to picture the scene. The devil comes on and says, you know, I can knock anybody off. And, 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 and he's, he's going into like the throne room of heaven and accusing mankind. And uh, you never want God to say this about you. Consider my servant Isaac. Consider my servant Mike. Bad things are coming. He's like, listen, you want to see a good guy? Take that guy Job. And, and Satan's like, of course this guy worships you. His life is perfect. He's rich. He's got a great marriage. He's got great children. I mean, everything is good. He's respected by everyone. He's fulfilled completely. And God's like, yeah, go ahead. Take it all away from him. You can do everything you want to him, but kill him. That's a terrible assignment for Job. It literally says this in the first verse. He was blameless and upright. Now, I want you to pass the mic down to, uh, let's go to the top of page 14. Underneath the perseverance of Job, go down a section where it says, we're going to read, Stephen, I'm going to read the title, you're going to read the scripture, ready? I'm going to read four progressions. You want to talk about, you want to talk about a nightmare, okay? So this is after the whole thing, this is what happens to Job. Right, this is right in the beginning of the book. His, so you're going to read where it says, now there. His animals are stolen and his servants are killed. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sa Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So they took his, he took his stuff and killed the servants. Keep ready. Fire kills his sheep and more servants. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, <laughs> and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. The fire of God. This is the report. The fire of God did this. Right? Next, his camels are stolen and more servants die. While he was still speaking, another day. also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Okay, if you think that's not bad enough for a rich guy to lose his animals and his servants, which is his, his wealth. This, by the way, this is all in one day. Then... He's informed of a structure collapse. What happens in this structure collapse? While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Okay. All of his children died in a house collapse. Now, if you think you got trials, if you think you have reason to complain, do you know why James talks about tribulations and then names this one guy and calls it the perseverance of Job? This is Job's response to that. Then Job rose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped and said... <laughs> Naked I came from my mother's new womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin, nor did he charge God, God with any wrongdoing. If you ever, ever, ever feel like you don't have the patience or perseverance to deal with something, just read Job chapter 1. By the way, there's 41 more chapters. The end of the story is this, and this is where we'll close today. The last four verses of that, that 
unbelievable testimony. Here's what God is promising. This is why if you connect it to Romans 5 and you say the hope, the hope will never disappoint. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He had ten more children after this point in time. And he called the name of the first one Je Je Gemina, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Keren Hapuk. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his grandchildren for four generations. All for what reason, guys? Patience and perseverance. And he never indicted God once. See, this is why James, you know, he's not just giving some little Christianese teaching. He's, he's referring to his roots and what he knows this means. And he's giving us the hope that Christians, we have a former reign and a latter reign. Now, when he wrote the, those words 2,000 years ago, he was very far from the latter reign. I'm going to say this. I don't think we are very far from the latter reign. I think that's what's happening in the earth. God's about to pour out again so his people um, develop into wheat and not barley. Got it? And next time we meet on James, we're going to cover just one verse. Verse 12 in chapter 5. It has something to do with your word. Like your yes being yes and your no being no. After all this, I'll, I'll give you a little preview. After everything we just said. Now, I hope you could feel the intensity of that. The next verse says, by the way, above all, more important than all of this, let your yes be yes and your no be no. How important is that? Okay, guys, we'll see you the next time. Amen. Amen.